so we have we have our expert panel dr mahipal he may join in late dr namita sharma dr titiyal dr praveen and thank you dr somshila come and sit on the first row and uh, we shall now go on to our uh, you have to wait for a second we have to go on to our first speaker of this session because he needs to catch a flight uh, we have uh, dr krishna prasad kudlu he needs no introduction a uh, most popular and dynamic national figure in ophthalmology and member scientific committee and the big man in karnataka and looking at political connections so we look forward to hearing from him on a very relevant topic current trends in presbyopia correction preferred practice guidelines thank you chitra madam for a wonderful introduction i think uh, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, ARC program and this time madam has really made a history to get the fantastic programs from ARC. As a scientific committee mem member, we are very much uh, proud and also feel jealous that madam has done such a wonderful program. <laughs> so this is my financial disclosure. I'm consultant for Carl Zeiss India. So just for beginners, what exactly is a press biopy? It's a physiological pro progressive loss of accommodation affecting individual in their middle age regardless of any underlying refract error causing difficulty in sharply focusing for near vision different principles used to correct press biopia either we can do mono vision one eye for distance and other eye for near or some of the examiner system even do a multifocality treatment you can try the people used to try with that or with the increased depth of focus what we do it with the camera inlays and even you can go for a combined approach. See, I was just a few of my friends from Colombia. They have been trying something called a FOV tears. Uh, it's a mix, uh, all, uh, mixture of uh, parasympathetic eye drops. They say that definitely it corrects presbyopia. I don't have any experience with that. Of course, spectacles everybody been using. Even some of the international companies also come up with the multifocal contact lenses. So these are the surgical options for press biopia. You've got lens-based procedure, you've got multifocal, trochlear lens, trifocal, EDOF. E corneal procedure, you've got press B LASIK, press B on, and uh, corneal inlays. And one or two word about sclerociliary complex modification. You People in Europe, they're still doing scleral spacing device or laser ace procedure. So I'll not talk about much about multifocal IELTS. Uh, if you got uh, astigmatism, you can think about toric multifocal IOL. Of course, uh, now most of the we surgeons are uh, converted to trifocal intraoculars because of the advantage of intermediate vision. Oh, but now EDOF lens has become more and more popular because of the great nature of uh, very less glare and halos and even you can implant in the very young individual. They want to treat comfortably in the night and also can look at the meter board very easily. These are the couple of lens, one is from Zeiss and this is Acris of IQ VVT, I think uh, once again it's a non-diffractive EDOF lens at which has got a very good distance and uh, uh, a reasonably good uh, near vision too. So a lot of my friends even still doing with the non-dominant eye multifocal and non-dominant eye with the uh, EDOF lens, they're still getting a good results for press biopia. Even I think I don't have much experience. I think our friend Kamal might have done a few of the mul fake multifocal lens from one of the Indian company. Even I have tried a couple of patients with the sulcoplex uh, pseudo fake lenses. So ca these corneal inlays has become popular much uh, five, six years before. Most common one is camera inlays. Normally we put it in the non-dominant eye by making a small pocket within the stroma. But uh, all these inlays have got a problem. Definitely there is a slight reduction in the distance vision in non-dominant eye, glare and halos and reduced contrast sensitivity. So sclerociliary complex modification, what they make, they put a 4 PMMS segments which is implanted, make a 4 incision and they put it within the sclera, it will have a near vision effect. Even people tried with it, this is something called laser ace procedure by giving a YAG laser to ablate 600 micron in the sclera which presumed to have to free the ciliary muscle to contract normally have a near vision effect of 1.5 adapter. So let me come to the laser options. I think Presby LASIK, uh, 10 years before a lot of people are done, it's a multifocal LASIK treatment based spheric, induces spherical aberration. 
but uh, normally they had a good near and uh, intermediate vision but the problem is initial compromise of the distance vision lot of pe people take up to three months to adopt this treatment it is a people dependent and also the patient complained about the near vision so coming to the supra core some of my friends in india been doing this with the help of uh, examiner system technology 217 from bosch and lam unlike monovision which one eye is treated for distance and other eye treated for near here each eye has has to treat for both for distance and near there is something different in supra core so how it works actually it makes the use of central near peripheral distance concept wherein during the natural accommodation when i focus on the near object the pupil constrict and i looks it through the near elevation but when i is looking at a distance pupil dilate allows the peripheral rays to pass through the aspheric optimized periphery to improve the distance vision but basically hyperopic treatment lot of require retreatment yet to become more and more data with that so presbyon i've been doing last 12 years uh, excellent results basic important is refraction dominant eye testing i myself being a doctor i do for me it takes almost 45 minutes to finish all this test of micro monovision testing these are the principle of laser blinded vision monovision depth of field uh, neural submission blur adaptation and neural separation what we make we make dominant eye emetropic make the non dominant eye myopic by 1.5 adapter blend zone is the zone where the vision from dominant and the non dominant eye meets up and binocularity retains so along with that we also create a spherical aberration in both the cornea so why we pick this in a small children you have seen brain tend to suppress certain blur from the eye same principle you have taken basically it's a bilateral treatment and um, this is our results i think uh, more what i wanted to just say none of the eyes actually in, in our lost more than half a snellen lies of vision when compared to pre operated corrected disturbed visual acuity so these are the advantage with press beyond not depend upon the pupil size i have done up to minus 8 adapter even with the uh, uh, hypermetropic of eye adapters all my patients are a very good intermediate and near, new vision and more than 97 percent of the patient adapt very well so take home summary i think very important dominant eye testing has to be done very well age between 40 to 55 laser refractive surgery more than 55 years age i think you should opt for lens based procedure type of refractive whether it is myopic or hypermetropic wait for the stability of the refraction go for laser refractive surgery if patient in a hurry you can still opt for les lens based procedure of course in apirometry very important check for dysfunctional lens index if there is no cataract press band is the option when you see in the end uh, compared to multifocal IOL, corneal inlay press b max supra core i think as far as the distance vision intermediate vision near vision night driving problem contrast sensitivity adaptation press band will have a uh, edge over all this treatment once again i thank chitra madam for this wonderful opportunity thank you ananda thanks, thanks a lot for uh, sparing this morning before you catch a flight all the best to you thank you madam That's the message I want to the audience that let us not get aggressive with the younger lot because there is a eight times chances of getting a retinal detachment. And actually, if you do a th thorough examination, if it have, they have already have a PVD, then it's even better. It gets even safer if you are planning it a year or two in advance. Just one question, uh, Dr. Kudlu, sir, very nice presentation. Just wanted to ask a question. Sorry, if you have operated on a patient for press by uh, press by correction, like say press by on at the age of 40, w now you have said you have had an experience of over 12 years. When they come back to you, say 10 years later, 
at that time do you give them a near ride or now they are resigned to the fact that they would need a near ride yes yes so that gives two diopters Uh, the sequence is going to change a bit about the speakers and I want you all to clearly understand the session is preferred practice guidelines. I want one, two, three, four points. How would you manage these cases? I do not want any introductions at all. I want to go on to the content. How would you manage? What are the challenges? What are the limitations? That's what the audience is wanting. So our next speaker is Dr. Vardhaman Kankaria, uh, who is the director of Asian Eye Hospital, Pune. And again, uh, very, a very, very versatile, impressive surgeon in cataract and refractive surgery. And he would be talking on corneal tomography and ASOCT, the key to selecting cases, preferred practice guidelines. Thank you so much, ma'am. And um, so again, thanks to Dr. Chitra, ma'am, for the kind invite. I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, friends, we all know that uh, from the time of RK, which was about a century ago, to the current generation of refractive surgeries, when, where we have the complete armamentary of procedures which are available to us with variety of corneal refractive procedures, fakic lenses, as well as refractive lens exchange in selected patients. The success of refractive surgery still remains in the preoperative evaluation. It is of utmost importance that we reject at-risk patients and eliminate the possibility to the extent possible uh, of the post-LASIK ectasia and plan the most appropriate procedures. And to do that, uh, it is important that we actually meet Can certain basic eligibility criteria that, that we yeah, all are aware about. Year, yeah. But the most important eligibility today one remains the assessment of cornea to withstand and maintain the effects of corneal laser procedures, yeah. which can be assessed with the help of corneal tomography and ASOCT, especially the corneal epithelial mapping of current generation. Uh, we all know that compared to the topography, the corneal tomography gives us much better localized uh, elevation map that helps us to detect keratoconus patients uh, when they are in form of first day or very early stages and has many advantages over uh, topography and it has by and large replaced corneal topography as the assessment tool. Uh, coming to the preferred guidelines uh, for the uh, tomography for me, basically these are some of the things that I look at. Uh, uh, it is important to look at the K-max, uh, which is your highest keratometry and anything beyond 48 diopters, I avoid corneal procedures for them. Uh, when it comes to the corneal curvature, the superior to inferior asymmetry, where inferior is more steep than the superior by 1.5 diopters, or when you have a superior steepening in which the superior is more than inferior by about 2.5 diopters, uh, becomes one of the relative contraindications. It is important to look at the skew skewing uh, in the center, as you know that uh, any skewing of the axis more than 21 degrees or 22 degrees is suspicious of developing uh, post-operative ectasia in these patients. Always look at the best fit sphere, that it is uh, 8 millimeters, so that it gives you the best possible uh, elevation map. Uh, abnormal anterior and posterior elevation more than 8 or uh, 18 microns is what is considered to be suspicious. And of course, it is very important that you look at the pachymetry of this patient. Uh, for me, uh, I don't go below 500 microns for LASIK as well as for smile procedures. And uh, for surface ablation, I have slightly more room. I go up to 480 or sometimes for up to 470 microns for very, very low myopia. Uh, with the advent of Bailey Ambrosio display, it has become even more easy and uh, for uh, especially newer refractive surgeons to identify this at-risk corneas. And as you know, Bailey Ambrosio display has uh, the regular elevation map, the uh, basically what is called as an enhanced display in which you are actually removing the central three millimeters of the elevation and then you are getting a difference map. And it actually tells you like an idiot proof uh, system where it is uh, at risk or it is not uh, if you look at just the color codes of the system. On the right side, you are looking at the corneal uh, thickness uh, spatial variations where we already know that the cornea is thickest in the center and it is, uh, it is thinnest in the center. It becomes much thicker in the periphery and there is a gradual, uh, there is a gradual uh, uh, graduation of this thickness uh, entity and you can see that there is a standard deviation. So as long as your line is within that standard deviation, we are looking at a very normal scan. But whenever you feel that this is actually deviating from the standard deviation, you have to be suspicious. 
again now with the help of the bad d uh, scores it has become very easy for us to know which are the corneas which are at risk the golden rules or the preferred practice patterns for me for whenever i see a abnormal uh, pentacam i do not exclude them immediately i take three captures with good quality and consider the median uh, as the median image uh, i then i ex try to exclude the false positive and false negative by looking at variety of the factors that we have seen and especially now also including the epithelial maps whenever the topographic astigmatism is less than one diopter uh, you have a patient with large angle kappa there is a misalignment when you have captured the image or there is a enantiomorphism these are some of the things that can help you to dismiss the issue with the uh, skewing of the axis so if i have uh, one abnormality which is moderate uh, uh, if i have no risk factors at all then of course uh, surface ablation smile as well as uh, lasik procedure all three of them are possible even if i see one uh, mild to moderate abnormality in the scan and it is a low myopia then i always go with the advanced surface ablation and my uh, my uh, let's say uh, criteria for smile and lasik remains the same so i don't uh, do smile for patients where i would not do a lasik and of course wherever you have a two or more a uh, moderate or one high abnormality you should avoid any kind of corneal laser procedure so you can look at this scan so basically this is a very flat cornea where you would actually avoid a microkeratom lasik and my procedure in such patients will be smile which is a flapless procedure now this is a patient uh, who is hyperopic in hyperopic patients i do prefer to perform a topo guided femto lasik such as contura again this is a patient where you can see a very nice symmetric bow tie and high astigmatism of 2.50 diopters again the procedure of choice is going to be topo guided femto lasik procedure and in this patient where you have a inferior steepening surface ablation where you have a very steep cornea again surface ablation and where you have uh, absolutely you cannot have a suspect kind of situation where you can combine cross linking with uh, uh, surface ablation procedure which is called as prk extra as well but in all the abnormal other scenarios where you have a very thin cornea or abnormal uh, corneal uh, uh, corneal uh, topography you should always go for icl implants uh very briefly i'm going to take uh, talk to you about the asocity actually the epithelial mapping is actually evolving as one of the very important adjunctive tools for the refractive uh, surgery selection as you can see one of the amazing things about epithelium is that it works like a masking agent so in the early keratoconus you will see that when there is early ectasia which is developing inferiorly but you will still see that the epithelium is actually becoming thinner therefore your tomography will still come normal however when the keratoconus increases the epithelium will become thinner and thinner and actually that is when your tomography as well as the epithelial mapping will become abnormal uh, studies by reinstein et al have shown that the epithelium is actually uh, thicker uh, in the superior versus in the inferior quadrant and uh, in the keratoconus it has a annular pattern where you actually have a very thin epithelium in the center can i just take a minute more ma'am yeah thank you uh, and it has the annular ring around it where it becomes thicker and thicker and as the progression of keratoconus increases you will see actually the thinnest uh, epithelial uh, 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 area is becoming thinner and thinner and the annular air, uh, area is becoming actually much thicker now let's look at this example where you have a truncated uh, bow tie here and actually the cornea looks otherwise completely normal but if you look at the epithelial scan you will see that at the level of the this truncated a uh, bow tie you have a very thin epithelium so this actually becomes a suspect keratoconus and we should avoid doing a corneal refractive surgery on them otherwise looking at only tomography we would have actually gone ahead to do a refractive procedure against that as you can see there is a clear inferior steepening however if you look at the epithelial thickness the epithelium is actually much thicker in that area so actually here uh, is the role where it is uh, abnormal tomography but uh, which is actually shown to be a completely normal scan by the adjunct of epithelium uh, the epithelial scan also helps us to differentiate between keratoconus and contact lens related warpage as we have seen if it is a keratoconus you will have the thinnest point which is coincidental with the kmax uh, area of the kmax but when it is a contact lens warpage in fact the corneal epithelium will be much thicker there and the last slide is about this very nice study which is published by randan uh, randelman Uh, they have looked at the epithelial maps and they have seen in how many patients the refractive surgeon had to change their procedure of choice or completely exclude these uh, patients from getting a refractive surgery looking at the epithelial map as against what they had decided before and they have seen that in almost 30% of the patients their decisions have changed looking at the epithelial map therefore patients who were actually uh, were not considered to be at risk uh they were actually uh, somebody who were keratoconus suspect and the patients who were actually considered to be normal they turned out to have uh, keratoconus uh, suspect features 
And of course, ASOCT in post-operative time has the uh, ability to look at the residual bed thickness, uh, to look at interface fluid syndrome, as well as look at the epithelial length growth and its extent, and also to identify epithelial fistulas uh, at the incision. So to conclude, corneal topography, uh, tomography today has become a gold standard to identify at-risk corneas, but the corneal epithelial mapping by ASOCT is gaining importance as a great adjunct tool, especially in borderline situation, where you would like to really confirm your approach to this patient. Thank you so much again, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Vardhaman, that was an amazing talk. I did get interrupted identifying my next speakers, but I actually would love to hear it once again. Very good, very Thank thorough you. talk. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Anagha will take a question first. Yeah, uh, excellent talk, Dr. Vardhaman. Dr. Dr. Somshila, I wanted to ask you a question. Considering a case scenario, your patient comes to you for myopic LASIK, uh, K Max is 50 diopters. To be with us as expert panel, Vardhaman. Refractive error is minus 8 diopters and the pachymetry is 530 microns. Which procedure would you suggest? 530 microns minus 8 diopters and 50 diopters is the K-max. Because of the high refractive error, uh, depending on the AC depth, I would rather go with a intra, you know, implantable lens of AK Kyoel for this kind of patient. If there's it's an 8 diopters where you have a reasonably good uh, RST and the pentacam is normal. Yeah, so, so uh, without going to very detailed so discussion. So the message that I want to yeah. send across is on what basis are we suggesting this? What would be the risk factors if you go ahead with LASIK? Considering that the RST, PTA is all normal. What was the issue? I the that. issue is that the ketometry is 50 diapters. Oh, 50. And so 50 diapters no. is the extreme edge of... No, no. Uh, because the, the visual score. quality gets distorted if you do that. So you should not get flatter than 34. You should not get steeper than 48. No, this is not going to be flatter than 34. No, no, in general. I'm no, no, I'm saying giving. for this specific case, it's a 50 diopter with a minus 8 myopia with a good RS, uh, pachymetry okay. where you're going to have a good residual stromal bed. You're within the confines of a good PTA. So s why would you still go in for a fake KIOL? It's not even more than 10 diopters, it's eight diopters. So the message that I want to send across is what is the basis that you would uh, ask for a fake KIOL compared to a LASIK? Actually, she's myopia, we are flattening the cornea, no, Somshila. So her logic is you're not steepening it, you're flattening it. So uh, how do you believe it's going to compromise? Earlier days were using microkeratom LASIK. That would be a surgical complication is expected in steep corneas. But this is going to get flatter. I didn't hear a question, only now I heard it. So, so she I wants the answer can, why can you would say that. Can somebody please give me a specific answer to this question? So I'll just complete and, and of course I think we are on the same on the same yeah, team. Yes, yes. Oh. So my answer to this is that uh, Pentacam or what the, the Preferred practice guidelines are yes. what should help you and guide you here. Yes. As just as for preferred practice guidelines, the ketometry is definitely out of range yes. for what you, as per the practice, preferred practice guidelines. So you can make yes. exceptions. So yeah. without going to, so, uh, so yeah. if I want to sit on a podium and say, what are the preferred practice guidelines? So this is beyond the preferred practice guidelines. So we have to keep the patient in front of us and make a decision on case to case basis. But if I have this patient, Finances is not an issue and the AC depth is good. I have a patient who's going to follow up. My preferred practice for this patient would be a fake chiral. People may disagree. Sir, yes. please, your opinion. Please, can you give me the uh, logical, scientific yeah. explanation so behind this decision? First of all, I'd like to know the age of the patient. 50. If it's 30 not 50, year old, sir. No, no, 30 fifth, years. Fifth, uh, yeah, so if it's 30 a 30 years. year old person with a 50 uh, keratometry, maybe he doesn't have anything as yet. Number one. Number two. The optical quality, the visual quality, when you start flattening the cornea for eight diopters is definitely going to be different than what the person has been used to with the, the Q values the patient has. The optical quality, I've done MTF studies on my patient for high. So as a standard practice, in my practice, any dioptric power more than 6.5, I am going for fakey diopters. So, but That's here we are not practice. flattening it less than 34. Definitely there are going to be aspherical abrasions Absolutely. in any kind of refractive corneal based refractive procedures. That's Whether answer. it is 6 or 8. Now suppose it was 6 diopters. Would you go in for LASIK? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Sir, that, suppose it was 6 diopters. Suppose it was 6 diopters with a 50 diopter um, keratometry. Think, Would uh, you go in for LASIK? The, the, it's, uh, we are not getting the answer. We'll go on to the next question because just a minute less than that. The other thing is, if do, so in, in relevance to epithelial thickness mapping, if the epithelial thickness mapping is showing hyperplasia, Dr. Somshila, 
and uh, would you uh, and the patient has come for an enhancement uh, yeah. so would you want to do serial maps to look for stability before you enhance this patient yeah. Or would you do it as a two-stage procedure? Would you just do a PTK, look whether that has taken care of the residual refractive error, and later consider doing a PRK? So again, we if you know we are blurring the preferred practice guidelines. I think Vardhaman yes. brought yes. in ASOCT, and that was his yes. topic. Yes. But I would just like to first clarify that ASOCT is not a must-have in this at this point of time yes. for preferred practice to decide or not decide on refractive surgery. But it helps us in making those decisions, especially to detect posterior ketoconus, which you can see it better on the ASOCT, or to detect how much is epithelium playing a role. And of course, as you pointed out, in terms of uh, refractive error, which comes back, so is it residual, uh, is it uh, a progression, or is it ectasia? So the epithelial mapping definitely has a very important role to play. So if we have to serially epithelial map and don't decide on just based on one map because it could be just for that point in time depending on the, the drying of the eye and many other variables. Once you have reliable map which serially you've seen is the same. Then uh, there are two choices. You could go in with directly with uh, the enhancement because that's what the patient is for. Uh, I wouldn't uh, do a PTK and then go ahead. When I'm very sure that it's epithelium contributing to the refractive error, I would go ahead and then correct the residual refractive error or the induced there are more uh, uh, relevant questions for discussions here, but uh, I think I think one or speakers may not turn up. So, hello, Dr. Dhami. I'm nice seeing you. Very happy to see you. Uh, I'm going to change the sequence of speakers uh, based on the availability because there's a film festival going on and some of majority of my speakers are sitting there. And that's how... Uh, so, I'm going to call uh, her because he's fakey Kayol. So I thought I'll finish Hyperopia with Soundarya. So I'm going to uh, inviting my next speaker, Dr. Soundarya, who's a uh, young consultant, cataract, uh, cataract and refractive surgeon from the Eye Foundation group of hospitals and an amazing speaker and a very talented girl. And she would be talking on hyperopic corrections, options and precautions, preferred practice guidelines. On to you, Soundarya. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, ma'am, for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the options and precautions for hyperopic correction. So as we know, hyperopia is not as common as myopia, where 30% uh, of the population are myopic in our country, only 3% are hyperopics. So one thing that we need to know before going into this is classifying the hyperopia to decide what kind of treatment would be appropriate for each. So we have the low hyperopia, less than 2 diopters, then 2 to 4 diopters, and more than 4 diopters. So uh, the basics of treating hyperopia, the main thing is to aim at a stable refraction and topography before proceeding as with any laser refractive uh, procedures. And again, the age of treatment, more than 18 years and not progressive. One thing we need to remember is as the patient uh, becomes, patients become older, their accommodation goes down. So we need to keep that in mind and explain it to the patient as well. And they often have concomitant astigmatism, so that also has to be taken care of. So one thing, uh, another main important thing is the uh, thorough cycloplegic refraction that has to be done with homotropin before proceeding with the uh, cases because the problem with hyperopic correction is more of an undercorrection than the regression that happens. So and we need to correct the maximal acceptance and correct only if the difference between the acceptance and the cycloplegic values is less than one diopter. Um, another thing is the anisometropic amblyopia and squint, which is not very uncommon in uh, hyperopic patients. So this becomes one of the indications to correct patients less than 18 years of age as well. So here, before going ahead with the vision therapy and the squint surgery, it is better to treat the hyperopia first, give them similar sized images in both eyes, which would enhance our success with vision therapy. So what are the various options available? We have the laser vision correction, which would be the flap-based and the surface ablation procedures. And we have the tissue additive procedures. We have the fakic intraocular lenses, be it monofocal or presbyopic lenses. And finally, we have the refractive lens exchange. So when we're talking about laser refractive correction for high hyperopia, the major issue, as I told already, is the undercorrection. And uh, another thing we need to keep in mind is an initial post-operative myopia is always okay and it will subside with time. And uh, it's less predictable wound healing, wound healing is there here and the biomechanical response is also erratic. So regression chances are always there. And the poorer quality of vision when we steepen the cornea too much again is going to be an issue. And because of the over steepening, ocular surface issues are also going to be there. Just an example showing how the um, uh, mid-peripheral uh, flattening happens which causes an indirect steepening in the center. 
So the tree, uh, any character refractive procedure of hyperopia is going to become less predictable beyond three diopters and because it's more uh, difficult to predict an indirect uh, steepening of the cornea rather than the direct flattening that happens in a myopic treatment. So, and again, another limiting factor is the K-max of anything um, uh, beyond 40, uh, 48 is going to be uh, a, a difficult issue because every diopter of correction steepens the cornea by 0.6 diopters, which we need to keep in mind while planning the procedures. And as I already told, a hypoprolate cornea is going to predispose to ocular surface issues as well. So the EX500 can correct up to a plus six diopter of uh, hyperopia and a six diopter of cylinder. And here we need to keep in mind to have larger uh, flaps and a larger optic zone. And in patients with large angle carpas, we can also manually uh, uh, center the vertex uh, using the images from the topolizer. And as with contura, it's already centered on the visual axis. Just a few words regarding SMILE for hyperopia. It was first investigated in 2010 and they used a lenticule of uh, 7.5 mm and uh, which was thinner in the center and thicker in the periphery. And uh, the initial results showed regression and drop in BCVA. However, if we are able to provide improved normograms, a larger transition zone and optimized energy, SMILE may as well become a good option for hyperopia. Few words regarding the tissue additive procedures which are being tried right now. Uh, so we have the smile lenticules that can be added into pockets. So the advantages would be it provides a more physiological shape than uh, what is uh, a result of a laser refractive uh, procedure. And there have been no reported uh, rejections and it's also a reversible procedure. However, we definitely have the disadvantages of it being less predictable, predictable just like the laser procedures. The chances of undercorrection and regression are always there. And uh, the unique uh, difficulty here, challenge here would be the uh, a lack of ability availability of similar donor tissues. So when we come in talking about high hyperopia, again, as with uh, uh, according to the patient's age, we can decide if it's less than 45 years, fakie chiovas would be the choice. With more than 45 years, lens-based uh, procedures would be ideal. And any patient of any age with uh, AC depth less than 2.8 mm, obviously lens-based surgeries are going to be more preferred. So the advantages of fakie chiovas would be better predictability and faster visual rehabilitation, a more stable refraction, lesser incidence of dry eye and a better visual quality. And um, the fakie chiovas in hyperopia are biconvex, so they're thicker lenses. That's something we need to remember. And they're going to uh, increase the angle by 10 degrees. And uh, the ICLs don't have a central hole. And uh, the more thickness is uh, going to result in light scattering and dysphotopsia. And up to 15 diopters can be uh, customized with the IPCL. So um, uh, just a few words regarding the press biopic fakie chiovas. They are trifocal uh, diffractive lenses, which can provide up to uh, plus 1.5 to plus 3.5 diopters at the lens plane. So coming to the clear lens exchange, so as we know, even before cataract develops, the lens dysfunction begins. So as the aging happens, the spherical abrasion is going to in increase, the light scattering, the refractive index, the size of the lens is also going to increase, whereas the transparency and the accommodation start coming down. So now why is clear lens exchange becoming a more preferred option? Because we have better accurate biometry, excellent post-surgical visual outcomes, the availability of premium lenses, and the uh, active lifestyle of patients beyond 50, and the desire to get rid of glasses are also there for the patients. And it's uh, going to be effective with the careful counseling, meticulous evaluation, and flawless surgery. We can end up with satisfied patients. And uh, obviously with shallow AC, lens extraction is going to be more preferable. As with uh, myopia, there's not going to be an increased risk of uh, retinal detachment and the minimal induction of higher order abrasions. And, uh, but the only challenge here is in higher hyperopia, chances of choroidal effusion are always there. In extreme hyperopia, up to 65 diopters has been customized and we can always go ahead and put a piggyback lens as well. So just to summarize, a uh, younger patient with a refractive uh, uh, correction of plus three or lesser, definitely laser refractive or keratorefractive refractive procedures are a choice. So anything beyond that, patient less than 45 years, fakie chiovas would be the choice to go. And if the anterior segment parameters are normal and beyond 45 years, clear lens exchange is always an option. Thank that you. was a wonderful talk, Soundarya. And uh, I would want my speakers uh, to stick to six minutes and two minutes discussion. Sheetal could connect her slides. Uh, one question which I'm going to ask Dr. Dhami and uh, Somshila, even if they differ. The patient is very desirous of great visual quality uh, and uh, would, you have, would you think of a laser vision correction or a fakie chiol to this patient in this hyperopia? Hyperopia is a talk. What do you have to say, Sri Ganesh? 
sorry somshila he was vigorously nodding his head i wanted to know something in, in young uh, patients uh, they lose accommodation yes. and also there's a, a lot of induction of uh, abrasions yes. which cannot get corrected because you mm. removed the natural crystalline lens mm. uh, i would do a tissue addition and that's what i've been doing for uh, no no you have person. to reach out something to the audience please my audience i need to know the answer you we don't See, want for, some very new advanced See, procedure for up till four adapters you yes. can do uh, lasik smile will be available shortly that commercially but those who have access to smile can do tissue addition uh, you know uh, yeah. shreyas has done yeah yeah i agree it, but smile everybody is not no, happening because are, we can't see, between, we have to send them mes- uh, right messages between, at this between 4 to 9 adapters okay there is no uh, corneal procedure right now except yes. tissue addition yes. and that works beautifully patient can still maintain their accommodation we have a eight year follow up patients doing very well refractive lensectomy for a very young patient not very desirable young patient if they are over 45 then it's okay okay i'm going on to the next speaker if there is time we have lot of questions we'll discuss but because we started a bit late dr sheetal introduce okay. uh, uh we have dr sheetal who's a senior consultant uh, cataract and refractive surgery from netradama group of hospitals based in uh, bangalore and uh, as you saw her walking with a award is probably 3 to 4 or 5 awards she gets every year in national international uh, conferences and kudos to her and we are really enlightened to have her with us and she is going to tell us on bringing out the evading risk factors ectasia post refractive surgery preferred practice guidelines thank you so much ma'am good morning everyone uh, thanks for the invitation to participate in this wonderful session so i'll be talking about uh, ectasia post refractive surgery and uh, we will also have a current outlook on screening and management options so as refractive surgeons our biggest fear is always post operative ectasia and uh, this still remains one of the most significant complications of uh, corneal refractive surgeries now some of the risk factors are already known to us uh, such as uh, pre operative high myopia or high propia thin corneas abnormal topography eye rubbing pregnancy hormonal imbalancing uh, imbalances however some of the risk factors are still not known and uh, we will see what they could be so uh, there have been uh, various studies where they have found the incidence of post lasik ectasia which is anywhere from 0.02% to 0.6% most of these cases of ectasia uh, that what have been published in these papers uh, were because of faulty preoperative case selection and also inability to detect at risk corneas we also recently published a paper on smile ectasia and uh, the incidence of the same from our institute uh, so it was 0.15% and uh, what we also found was that there was a 5.7% higher relative risk of ectasia in borderline eyes versus normal eyes and uh, so this is a very significant finding so let us look at the current outlook on screening and management options so uh, various indices have been recently introduced to help a refractive surgeon uh, detect uh, ectatic corneas before refractive surgery and uh, one of this is uh, keratoconus percentage index or the kisa value so uh, basically any value between 60 to 100% uh, is indicative of a subclinical keratoconus then uh, randelman ectasia risk scoring system is a very popular scoring system wherein Uh, they have used various parameters such as topographic patterns residual bed thickness age corneal thickness and uh, mrsc and it gives you a collective score of uh, risk uh, uh, risk scoring system and uh, here any score more than 3 is actually uh, a moderate risk and anything more than that is a uh, high risk so uh, this system however uh, w- uh, when it was verified it was uh, said that it can actually miss a significant proportion of patients uh, at risk of ectasia so it's not a full proof scoring system so there may be other factors that uh, would be playing role in ectasia uh, development so after that came the ptx uh, pta index which is a percentage tissue um, uh, altered so basically what they say is that it is not the residual bed thickness which is important but it is the tissue that is altered by the refractive surgery which uh, is actually more significant in ectasia development and uh, it considers the uh, the flap thickness uh, 
um, flap thickness, ablation depth, and uh, which is uh, uh, added and then divided by the total corneal thickness. So a uh, value of 40% or less is considered to be, to be normal. Anything more than 40%, uh, they say, is high risk for ectasia. Then uh, is the index uh, uh, rabinovitz mcdonald So this also has has uh, different uh, parameters, central K, inferior superior steepening and uh, SRAX, so this also can be used. Now what is, uh, we all are more familiar with this one, this is the bad display that combines both the posterior and anterior elevations and pachymeter data to provide a 3D tomographic representation of the cornea and compares it with that of the standard uh, uh, the database of corneal, uh, of corneal controls and keratoconus patients. So with all these indices, uh, we are still able to, we are able to pick up early keratoconus. However, there have been reports of ectasia in normal topography also. So what could be these kind of risk factors that, so we need additional in, uh, investigations to detect these. So integration of corneal biomechanics with Pentacam uh, uh, is uh, now uh, available and uh, it gives us corneal biomechanical, uh, Scorvis biomechanical index, biomechanical index, which is CBI. So this is based on cor uh, corneal thickness profile and deformation parameters. The normal value is within 0.5 and TBI, which is tomographic biomechanical index. So this is integration of Pentacam data for a combined tomographic and biomechanical analysis. Normal value is within 0.29. So uh, let's see how we use this uh, integration of corneal biomechanics with topography. So this is case one, 25-year-old female. Uh, sphere is it's a, a small refractive error, 1.75. The bad value is 1.96. So the normal is uh, 1.65, which is considered to be normal. So this is high. Uh, CBI is normal, but TBI is also on the higher side. Normal is 0 0.29. So this is a borderline case wherein you would probably want to do a smile extra or a PRK procedure and uh, this is another case where uh, uh, 26 year old male moderate myopia thin pachymetry bad is definitely on the higher side 2.27 CBI and TBI are also high so here we would probably not want to do any corneal refractive procedure so epithelial mapping is a additional tool that can help you detect early keratoconus so this is a case where you can actually see you f see a typical donut uh, shape pattern of epithelium. So this can be used to actually uh, confirm your findings of topography. Say this, this kind of this patient is look, looks like a suspect topography on Pentacam. Just it, it just has a high um, elevation values. When you do a MS39, you can actually see there's a thinning on, on the uh, in this area uh, over the cone and uh, in the mid periphery there is thickening uh, of the epithelium. And what is also important is the stromal elevation. So if you see this stromal elevation map, uh, there is an elevation of uh, about uh, uh, plus uh, 10 or 12 here. So that also, that so stromal topography is actually very important where you separate the epithelium and then look at the pathology. So it can also be used to enhance specificity, specificity and avoid false positive cases. Now this patient looks like a keratoconus is a posterior uh, um, elevation here. It's a suspect case, but when you do epithelial mapping, the epithelium is completely normal here. So there is no um, donut shape pattern uh, uh, developing here. So in this way, epithelial mapping can also help. So in terms of management, uh, there's nothing much new. You al already know in mild to moderate cases, uh, we have to do a cross-linking to stabilize the ectatic process. Uh, and depending upon the refraction and vision of the patient, you can choose either a conservative management or surgical management. In, in severe cases, we have to do DALC or penetrating keratoplasty itself. Um, just uh, just uh, a new thing that we have done in our institute is that uh, uh, we've had few cases of smile ectasia and we use the smile tissue um, in the pocket and uh, did the cross-linking and these cases actually did well, showing just one example uh, wherein a tissue addition was done and you can see there's a, a flattening of 4.5 diopters in the steep keratometry and 1.7 diopters in the flat keratometry and uh, patient's uh, vision and uh, ectasia improved. So this is one recent update on the management. Thank you very much, speech. Dr. Sheetal. Well, wonderful talk. Please, I want the timer and the warnings uh, thing to come at one minute. Nothing happened here. Uh, one question with uh, Sri Ganesh, could you connect your thing? And Somshila, I have a question to you and Dami could answer too. Like, supposing you've had a, a fellow, uh, 
an eye which has had an iatrogenic ectasia, how closely would you like to follow the other eye or would you prophylactically cross-link it? If the patient is in the age group where she's likely to be childbearing and all that. I would say that uh, depending on the fellow eye vision, the fellow eye vision is extremely good. So I might just wait on it. Uh, it's not, and we've had patients, it's not necessary that both eyes will continue to, uh, you know, progress. progress. So you cross-link the eye, which is obviously progressed and with the poor vision and, or maybe you do the cross-link with the intact. So whatever is the preferred practice that you want to go yeah. with. But the other eye, you do, depending on the vision, if the patient has good vision, not. And at least we could send the patient with very strict instructions not to rub their eyes and uh, uh, come very frequently for follow-up, especially if they are likely to get pregnant or any of those issues because uh, hormonal changes can be a trigger. Again, there's no guideline here. So some patients, you might just cross-link both eyes. Okay. Uh, there is more questions, but I think uh, we'll go on to the speakers. Uh, introduce Sri Ganesh. Yeah, I would like, <laughs> he doesn't need any introduction, so <laughs> I think his words speak more than his introduction. No, 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 all said and done, we owe to him, he's a chairman and managing director of the Netadama group of hospitals, a pioneer in refractive surgery, doing refractive surgery for more than 20 years, Sri Ganesh, or less? 25, 25. 25 years, and then he's the top man for smile and authority and comes up with so many innovative procedures. We are truly enlightened to have Sri Ganesh here. That's why I was on phone calls all through trying to get these people here on time. On to you, Sri Ganesh. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for inviting me to this preferred practice guideline course. And uh, good morning, dear friends. I'll just go through what are the preferred practices for smile because this is a new procedure. And... Uh, I am a consultant to Carl Zeiss uh, Meditech. So let us start with pre-op preparation. Before taking the patient into the OR, do not use anesthetic drops uh, or betadine because it alters the tear film, loosens the epithelium and there is an increased risk of black spots. Also if there is a high cylinder, more than 1.5, you should mark the 0 180 degree for uh, correction of uh, astigmatism before uh, taking the patient up and positioning under the laser. I prefer to use a solid blade speculum for patients with loose bulbar conjunctiva, otherwise Sit the conjunctiva the can seat. prolapse and uh, block the laser uh, and also there is an increased risk of suction loss. After draping and inserting the speculum, observe for pooling of fluids and soak the excess fluid with a sponge, otherwise it increases the risk of suction loss. Proper head positioning is very important so that the gantry does not touch the nose, so elevate the chin and turn the face in the opposite direction, especially in patients with prominent <coughs> nose. Do not touch the undersurface of the contact glass because stains may interfere with laser delivery and give rise to black spots. Coming to docking and uh, centration, this is a very important uh, step. Position the patient's eye by moving the Visumax bed on the 500. Now with the 800, the laser arm moves so that the visual axis is exactly in the center where the patient's eye meets the contact lens. There's a fixation, green fixation light which the patient can see. There are also concentric circles on the ocular reticule which can kind of help you to center. Uh, and center the tear meniscus and see that it is uniform. Applanate the cornea very slowly and ask the patient to look at the green fixation light. For smaller cones, up, applanate up to 80% and then you can put on the suction. For medium cone, you will have to hard, have a hard dock and applanate almost 100%. Once centration is ensured, then only you activate the suction, wait until the suction develops. You can see this with the, red, uh, with the blue LED lights and at least four sections of the blue LED light should um, get activated then you can recheck the pupil centration using the infrared light that's the strength of the suction I told you four segments on blue LED and then you also on the 500 you have an acoustic signal saying that suction on ready and then you can activate the laser with the foot switch uh, so when the uh, when the eye is under suction minimize background noise instruct the patient to remain calm not to move or squeeze explain that the green light will uh, disappear as the laser um, fires and you give them a countdown normally it's about 25 seconds with the 500 and about 8 seconds with the 800. So this is a video basically uh, I'm using the joystick to bring the bed up ask the patient to look at the green fixation light and um, you can see that uh, once uh, you center 
you can look at the meniscus there as you applanate and about 80% of the meniscus and then you can put on the suction. So the, what you have to watch for is impending suction loss. This is characterized by leak of fluid uh, and uh, darkening of the white area surrounding uh, the eye and escape of bubbles. And if this happens, better not to proceed with the laser treatment. Don't press the foot special. You, uh, you can release the vacuum, dry out the furnaces with a uh, sponge and uh, clean the undersurface of the contact lens with a wet sponge. Immediately redock. Consider replacing the contact glass if it cannot be cleaned properly. And once the eye is redocked, remaining steps of the laser delivery can be completed. This is a case where with a large angle kappa, you can see that it appears uh, decentered to the pupil, but actually it's on the visual axis. Uh, patient had a angle cup of about seven. So you can see that with the infrared, the pupil center and the line of sight is different. This is almost, a you can see that uh, there is quite a difference. So here with the Visimax, basically you center on the visual axis. Cyclotorsion compensation is very important. Uh, if the cylinder is more than one diopter, 1 1.5, definitely it is needed. You mark the 0, 180 degree on the cornea with an infrared transmitting dye, uh, you can use the viscose dye. You develop your own nomograms uh, for astigmatism de uh, depending upon the results. We use a 15% overcorrection for with the rule astigmatism. And use a large, larger optical zone for treating high cylinder, usually we use 6.5. And uh, this is the cyclotorsion compensation. After you dock, you can hold the cone and you can see that if the marks are away from the 0, 180, then you rotate it. You can make out the 0, 180 on your reticule or on the screen. And this is something that we published in the JRS and our results. And then this became a preferred practice guideline by Zeiss for correction of astigmatism. Energy optimization is very important and it has to be done so that there is no OBL and the uniform bubble layer is obtained. And for most Visimax lasers, this can be achieved between a fluence level of 24 to 40, corresponding to an energy of 120 to 200 nanojoules. This is the ideal bubble pattern. You can see there is no OBL and it's very uniform. So you'll have to try to achieve this by adjusting your energy levels. If you have a higher energy, it can give rise to uh, OBL and OBL again, uh, you can have difficulty in dissection you, and you can have uh, peripheral tears if it's in the periphery and then uh, irregular astigmatism and uh, poor visual recovery. So energy should be reduced stepwise until there is no OBL. Uniform bubble uh, pattern is uh, obtained. And if you go too low, then uh, you cannot see the bubble layer. You have black areas and then you can step it up. So it's like a Gaussian curve. You just keep reducing it. And then again, you go up uh, once you reach the threshold slightly. And uh, lower energy has shown to improve first day visual recovery. Uh, this is the sequence of the laser delivery. We will just go on to the video while I explain it. There is a, a spiral cut from outside uh, in. This we'll is a lenticule cut. Concise. Yeah, lenticule cut and then you have the 360 degree side cut and then uh, you have the cap cut which goes uh, spiral out from inside out and then you have the access incision through which you access the lenticule management. There are various instruments. Um, I've also devised some instruments and techniques. You can have a no dissection technique called lenticular slices but the standard technique is using the Reinstein dissector. You can see you go in separate the superficial and deep plane. First you tackle the superficial plane, uh, dissect it completely, including the uh, up to the side cut, then go into the deeper plane. And then uh, once you dissect it, you leave behind a tissue bridge on the right side, which I, uh, so that it doesn't kind of uh, tackle or fold over. Then you can go to the other side and then dissect it. And then you can either use a micro forceps or just once if it's fully free, you can bring it out. So these are just some of the uh, guidelines for SMILE. And uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I can take them. Uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh, Dr. Kamal, could you connect your site? I'm sorry, Dr. Kamal, for uh, pushing your thing because I wanted some cornea topics to get covered before Fiki Gayol. And Sri Gan Dr. Sri Ganesh, do have you felt that if there is a minimal decentration in SMILE as against a wavefront optimized, it does not seem to affect the visual outcome. Do you, can you explain why or do you disagree with me? See, I agree with you because uh, smile is more forgiving for decentration. Why this happens? Because in a wavefront optimized uh, um, correction, even if you are centered, uh, on the if you try to center, center on the 
normally the eye tracker centers on the pupil but if you even correct for it and then uh, try to center on the visual axis suppose you have a decentration if it's if the tracker is not okay or yeah. there's some problem what happens in a wavefront optimized uh, lasik is uh, because it is wavefront optimized there are extra spots which are delivered to the periphery okay because uh, uh, to maintain the prolate shape of the cornea that's why it's a wavefront optimized technique now if you are decentered and there are extra spots delivered then you have more uh, an ununiform kind of an ablation and uh, this can affect the visual quality induce coma much more because with smile uh, basically you are not giving any extra energy it's a clean lenticule excision so you don't have the cosine effect you don't have the summer winter effect so for smile you it's a uh, for giving up to 0.5 mm of uh, decentration whereas with wavefront uh, optimized it's 0.3 mm the studies also which confirm this thank you very much that was a very <coughs> sound explanation which you gave which is what i needed do stay with us as an expert panel dr sri ganesh yeah so inviting dr kamal kapoor sir he is the director of and founder of sharp sight center and one of the most dynamic surgeons that we have ever had very good morning dr chitra naga thank you for having me for this course i think uh, this is actually a hot thing for most of people are calling me for is fakey kaivals uh, okay uh, just a minute yeah so the finer nuances of uh, fakey kaivals and you know and the practice preferred practice techniques uh, there are so many options available in the market i'll go very fast and just zone in on to the relevant part uh, my main experience is with the ipcls i probably i probably do have the highest experience uh, in I, uh, ipcls of course i do a lot of icls also case selection and sizing up is the main cornerstone of doing a good surgery technically the surgery is not difficult at all any good fakey surgeon can practically ma master the surgery practice guidelines what i follow in my practice would be you know excluding myopias you have to look at these patients with a distant direct ophthalmoscope because a lot of times you might miss early sclerosis on a slit lamp any evidence of slight development of cataract if it's a developmental cataract please notice and mention it in the file inform the patient because these cataracts most of the times are non progressive but if it's a central sclerotic cataract it is going to progress corneal uh, endothelial counts beginners should restrain going below 3 mm to start with in the anterior chamber depth always look for the lens rise this is a new concept which i have introduced over last two years and it's really helping a lot of my colleagues you you have equipment which can actually measure lens rise we will go to that look for pupils which do not dilate properly because if the pupil is not dilating properly and you have a cornea which is 12 so you will be going in for a size of 13.5 you're going to have hell of a trouble putting this lens through a 8 or 8.5 mm pupil so beginner should refrain from going in for pupils which do not dilate well number 2 if your resting pupil size is too big be careful because in a standard practice we are not taught about measuring the pupil size so as a standard practice protocol mention your scotopic resting pupil size also and also mention how much does your pupil dilate when you dilate the pupil because this will actually help you plan your surgery size your lens and actually plan your optic size very large pupils in my practice any pupil size more than 7.2 is marked as large pupil on the file and the order is given for a larger size optic keratoconus patients you have to be very careful these can be very tricky because in the keratoconus patient you can have a false anterior chamber depth which is high please measure and note the angles have a gonioscopy measure the angles on an asoct document it and i would also recommend doing a pi in keratoconus patients because i have had i burned my hands in patients where everything seemed fine but then there was an erroneous vault which was totally unpredicted so i have a large series of uh, surgeries and long follow up i'll just skip this so the 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 practice of workup is the dilated acceptance cycloplegic acceptance of these patients as uh, dr himanshu mataliya said because a lot of time you would have a patient who's wearing minus 9 but his refraction is 7 but he's just been accommodating because somebody gave him wrong glasses so you will land up in trouble do a cycloplegic acceptance if the astigmatism is more than 3 diopters always measure the vertical diameter also this will help you to plan the optic size and the vault because if you go for a larger optic size you will have higher than expected vault anything between 150 to 250 microns so if you have a higher astigmatism especially if your vertical axis is steeper please mention that 
it's a good idea to do an axial length also and document it in your file. God forbid these patients may have uh, retina detachment, these are high myopes. So at that point you want to do a cataract and silicone oil at the same time. So it's a good idea to do a biometry and document it. As I said, keratoconus always be very, very careful. Gonioscopy, specular microscopy, as I said, biometry is very important. So make it as a standard protocol. It's the workup which is most important. The surgery is over under two and a, under two and a half minutes. So this is a very, very important point. So what are the breakpoints you will have? If you are a person who uses a pilocarpine at the end of the surgery, expect a lower vault from anything between 200 to 300 microns lower for first one or two days. So don't get psyched up. If you've used a myotic and you're seeing a vault of 300, 400, relax, you will get 500 to 700 once everything goes. Look for IOP rise within first few hours of the surgery. This is a standard protocol I recommend to all my friends because especially if you're a beginner surgeon, you might end up leaving some viscoelastic there and you'll have a pressure spike within first few hours. So if you see this patient, put the patient on slit lamp, put a little bit of paracane after a few hours and use the needle to burp from the side port. If you see any opacity in the retro, retro uh, uh, phacic lens area, don't be alarmed, especially within the first few weeks. This is not cataract, this is a 10 viscoelastic. All you need to do is do an ASOCT, find out what it is. If you have extreme of anything, very flat cornea, very steep cornea, plateau iris, a lens, high lens rise, watch out because these patients will behave differently. So as I again, I must mention, pupil size is very important. It is not stressed by a lot of people who are doing fake lenses. My long track record I've realized, pupil size plays a huge role in your patient satisfaction. Time. So, uh, time over? Okay, fair enough. No, anything to add, conclude, you could conclude because you know. It's okay, so the, there are two major options. You have 0 0.25 decimal size variations in the IPCL. You have 0.5 in the ICL. I prefer playing with very, very fine tuning. So I prefer tilting more towards the IPCL, especially in situations when you have 11.1 and 11.15, what do you do? But when you're operating on an IPCL, you can play with 0.25. So you can probably have a very high vault in one eye and a normal vault in another eye if you're going with an ICL because just a 0.5 measure here and there, 0 0.05, can make the whole thing go here wire. Excellent talk, Dr. Kamal Kapoor. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. If you, what are the factors that you think would cause a rotation in the ICL or the IPCL? Very interesting case. I was just discussing yesterday. I had a similar session. Uh, normally, it's it, it's a bad measure. It's a bad measure. Most of the people are using automated measure on an infrared camera because most of the equipment they use is automated. We just corroborate it with a caliper. So recheck it manually. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal. Uh, look forward to having you in many more of our sessions. Uh, we shall go uh, on to my talk on uh, regression post-refractive surgery, when and how to intervene. Now, I'm going to try to go fast that we all know that if it's a high, high refractive error, a thin stroma, if you have made a mistake of using a smaller zone, and if there is high astigmatism, a patient is older in age group, dry eye status, if there is a progression of axial length, it could be that, keep that in mind. Or if there is a latent hyperopia which is unraveling and lenticular shifts, these are the causative factors. And then why? Why is all this happening? Because epithelial hyperplasia and remodeling is occurring. It occurs more if there is an inflammatory cascade, if there is a dry eye status, because there could be also inflammation, there could be altered re patterns. Steeper gradients which can happen in high myopic and astigmatic correction increases the epithelial response, stromal mechanical, biomechanical response, reduced tensile strength because of the thinner stromal bed and forward protrusion of the posterior lamellae and the myopic shifts which Occurs. That is why people say that there's a temporary role of use of an IOP lowering agent, although we know it does not stand. 
regression again we see more in microkeratome flaps because of the meniscus configuration of these flaps which encourage more epithelial remodeling to the planar configuration more seen in high corrections in surface ablation and the good news is that smile has lesser regression than lasik now what do you do you have to investigate and plan our course so slit lamp look at the flap edge is the edge looking regular irregular is it more fibrosed is it going to be a little difficult to lift the flap is the flap looking centered how is the hinge looking is it low look at the corneal thickness is there a pachymetric progression is the surface irregular is it regular is there an inferior steepening skewing axis look at the floats is there any suspicious elevation points look at aberrometry without fail is the uh, uh, optic zone okay is the higher order abrasions more is the point spread function more do you need to enlarge the optic zone do you need to do something more when you are treating this patient look at the epithelial maps the thickness of the epithelium will help you plan your enhancement please without fail do a biometry in all these patients do an ASOCT to understand the flap thickness and the uniformity of the flap and if it is a dry eye status please treat it before you do enhancement now your options are many. I am not going to read out the option. Let me go option one after the other. Flap lift. I would prefer to do it only less than three years of, and that too, that I would keep as an outer limit. And I would try to be very careful with I lift the flap, make it smooth so that you do not disrupt the epithelium surrounding, so that you do not have an epithelial ingrowth. Try to aim for a centered flap within safety parameters. Avoid living th lifting thin flaps, buttonhole flaps, irregular flaps, even if it is less than three years and if beyond three years you find you are not in a you can't do a surface ablation for any reason it's better to debride the flap a little beyond the flap margin all around and then lift the flap now if you're going to lift the original flap there may be a need what has happened that the primary flap is decentered you could think of taking a deeper cut if the thickness really allows so these are all more in the microkeratome flaps yes sometimes in a femto flap also you could do there is some uh, people who do mini flaps if the primary flap is very thick but there could be flap de de uh, fragmentation best not to do surface ablation is a major boon for primary uh, enhancements or even for complicated cases but I would like to add a mitomycin in every case because I not it definitely is needed to address the uh, haze which can occur and if it is a borderline topography I wouldn't mind combining it with low fluence cross linking I'm sure Signesh would agree on that and of course uh, in uh, thinner flaps you should expect micro striae when you are ablating over a thinner flap be prepared that there could be an epithelial delayed epithelial healing in some of these eyes so please plan your protocol accordingly if it is a smile it depends whether you want to stay flapless then you could do you could go ahead and uh, do a primary smile above as a smile above or below the primary smile dr sri ganesh has uh, experience on that i don't you could do a prk you could do a circle software and again there is this uh, option of doing a thin flap plastic if the initial cap is quite thick uh, the basic uh, important thing we need to know is to do a thin flap plastic your calf initial flap has to be very thick and it should not impinge on the original interface that has to be kept in mind I already told you when you do a smile is can be converted to LASIK and this can be done if you use a circle software there are different approaches I'm not going to go into A, B, C, D but the most sensible approach is to do a D approach where you create a lamellar hinge and then the junction cut and the side cut and you lift the flap as you can see you have created a ring around it and then all you have to do you have converted the smile cap into the flap and you go ahead and lift the lift the flap as it is being lifted here and then you go ahead and do the eczema laser so what we need to understand is that these are the different options which we have if you want to do a uh, regression treatment enhancement post smile procedure commonly we would uh, do a prk we could do a circle software otherwise smile over the cap or underneath are the different options fakey kyoles would rarely be needed for large residual errors it should have been a mistaken entry otherwise i don't think we would need to do a fakey kyole at all as far as the complications is concerned let's remember all the primary complications can occur you should anticipate epithelial growth you should anticipate haze you should anticipate ectasia you should anticipate dlk and rarer occurrence of infection and increased dry eye status has to be countered but Let's conclude saying that well investigation, regressions can be definitely well managed. Kumar, can you connect your slides, please?
Excellent Any presentation, ma'am. Uh, yeah. uh, I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Somshila and Dr. Dhami, sir. At what point of time would you take the decision for retreatment? The period after the uh, primary surgery has been done. So, as you mentioned that if it is obviously an error, error erroneous enter, en entering the... No, suppose there is no error, you have treated perfectly and you are seeing regression. So, at what point of time would you diagnose it? At what point of time would you treat take the decision of treatment so, so if it's lasik pretty much by the end of one week i know that uh, there is uh, you know so how would you differentiate between under correction and regression no she's asking a very valid question what she's asking is when are you going to do enhancement you know there is uh, regression has happened what so did you say so we need to differentiate so, yeah, for the so benefit of know, the audience uh, we need to have so these are basic questions i understand but i yeah, just so, wanted some so more clarity so i just try to just answer that very briefly. Yeah. So when we, we're using the term, what we mean is let's make it broader and say residual refractive error yes. or a refractive error after the refractive surgical procedure. Yes. So it depends on the duration, depends on the cause. As we mentioned, incorrect entry yeah. can happen very rare. So we do it right away. There's no point waiting. Yeah. Uh, unless it's PRK, then you need to wait. But then if it is, uh, the if it's regression, as in it comes in later, it comes in at six months or the patient comes back to you at the end of one year, and you see that it's stable. So you might have a couple of visits for the patient to make sure it's stable. You assess and see that it is not uh, sort of an ectasia. And if it's epithelial thickness, that still needs to be corrected. So to answer that, it, we can't have a short answer. It depends on when has a uh, the, the refractive error reappeared and what is the cause of it. So those two, and it would have to be decided case to case. Uh, also, so many factors, like yeah. there could be an accommodation by the patient. You have to remove those... Uh, uh, issues. reasons of yeah those issues exactly yeah and you would want the topography and the refraction to be totally stabilized and definitely the minimum wait should be three months post refractive surgery procedure before you consider taking up and yeah and the options of course whether you're going to do a prk or a flap lift comes based on all that i said yes. we so kumar wanted to say something no we should do kumar because i think we have okay. to hand over the hall kumar has come running uh I would like to invite Dr. Kumar, doctor, who is the director of the Kumar Eye Institute, Dr. Kumar Eye Institute at Mumbai, and again, a cataract refractive surgeon with a pioneer in refractive surgery and uh, a lot, lot more. On to you, Kumar. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to show one case, uh, a decentered femtoflap. So you can see it's beautifully decentered. The hinge is in the middle of the pupil, and I managed to even bleed the conjunctiva. So, why did this happen, we'll discuss later. But if this happens, what to do is what I'm going to show. So, it can happen. It, it's just basically, this was a very old video, must be about nine years back. My initial femto cases, uh, that's bottom line here is to understand the technology that we buy. And if that gets a slip somewhere, this can happen. So, in case this happens, we have two options. One is to do a recut the same day. But my inexperience made me wait that time. And I let the patient go home and then call back. These bubbles, I, I don't know how many of you know, that these bubbles disappear in 45 minutes. You won't see anything there at all. And you know where your hinge is. So very important in this case is to know what was your targeted flap depth. And those times, we were not having so much of corneal OCT. In today's era of corneal OCT, we will actually know exactly. I may have targeted a one... Uh, 90 micron or 100 micron, but it may create a 95 micron. So doing a corneal OCT, maybe after a week or so, and get the idea of what it is. So one is now I want to recut, okay? So I'm using the same system, uh, getting a little more wiser. This is a Zimmer, and this was a Z4. Now I have a Z8, okay? So now I'm going to make a flap, and it makes a flap. So now very important is the flap has to be made deeper than your original targeted flap by about 15 to 20 microns. And it's pretty accurate. So if you remember, my original flap was here. So I'm not going to lift anything here. When I make a new flap, I'm going to just make sure that I lift from the area where my original flap was not there. So once I get that plane, I'm all sorted. So you can see that I never entered in the area where my original flap was made. And this you get a beautiful flap now. I've gone 20 microns deeper and you will see a little circle of the original flap that was there. 
Sometimes these bridges may interfere in your dissection, but otherwise it's pretty smooth and you can see a little bit of a hinge kind of a thing here, but otherwise you can see a smooth corneal surface and this gives excellent results. So, so that is one thing that I would like to say and then of course you go ahead and do your ablation and do everything is fine and everything is fine. Now I'm going to show you one more case. Okay. Now this was uh, in some times back we also used to do patients who had RK and we'll still go ahead and do a LASIK flap on that. Um, this I did and this was not a many cut RK. Okay. Now what happened is the patient, we do put a contact lens in these patients. The patient fell asleep in the afternoon, suddenly got up with severe pain. So in my experience, when a patient says severe pain, means he's done something to the flap. This is what I have found out a correlation between history and findings. So now this you can see is a eight cut RK came back with severe pain the same afternoon. Okay. So now the epithelium heals by evening many times. You might notice this that the epithelium has healed by evening. But as you see the RK flap is now torn into two pieces involving the visual axis. Okay. Don't worry friends even if this happens, uh, excellent results. I have not done anything very high tech from what you might have read, thought and this thing here what I am going to show is the epithelialization that happens on the surface make sure that the epithelium is removed. The back surface of the epithelium, the stromal flap which, which is cut is also cleaned. The other edge is also cleaned. So now you can see that you do not need to worry about right side up or left side up Okay, because the RK marks themselves when you align is the right orientation of the flap. So you don't have to worry ke stromal side up or epithelial side up. That's not an issue here at all. Now the question here was do you need to suture this or you don't need to suture this. You will be surprised if you get something like this. You really don't need to suture it. Okay, I, this, I did this and patients doing extremely well. I'll show you the post-op results too. And here you can see that I put the flap back and all the marks which are the RK marks are beautifully aligned. The question here when you see that this is going through the visual axis, will it leave a scar? Will there be epithelial ingrowth, etc, etc, etc and you'll be surprised that nothing happens. Okay, there is really nothing to worry. This heals beautifully and if you see this the next day you really don't see anything. But you have to spend that little extra time uh, to align it to make sure that the epithelial edges are all gone and once you cleaned it up completely, uh, I'll show you the picture first day post-op. We do put a contact lens again and you can see on slit lamp that the central visual axis is completely clear. So this is a result that you can achieve. You don't have to panic, nothing really happens but of course the patient has to be told to be careful and not rub the eye again. So these two cases I have to show. Lot. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you very much. Connect the thing. I am thinking, I'm sorry for rushing you, Kumar. I, he came running, so I wanted him to present. Uh, uh, one question to you, Dr. Sriganesh. Uh, if you had a case of suction loss, I've asked you earlier, I think, uh, suction loss in smile, would you advise that you wait for the OBL to settle down or would you proceed immediately? Uh, would you, uh, what would be the main thing you would confirm, even if you're going to do it with the OBL there? Basically, you will, you can immediately uh, redock, and because you have your bubble layer there, which acts as a guide for centration. But when the bubble layer is there, the patient cannot fix it at the green light. So you just massage the center, and so that you push the bubbles to one side, and the patient is able to see the green light. And then you have your circles in the reticule, which you can kind of correspond to concentrically to the uh, bubble pattern, and then redock. If you have any um, uh, black spots in the center then you then should wait. you should yeah then you do not do smile either you yes. wait postpone and then you can do a smile at a, d a deeper uh, level yes. or you can do surface ablation thank you very much uh, Gaurav would have to talk in 5 minutes and he, uh, he need no needs no introduction he is the chairman of the Dehradun uh, Drishti Eye Hospital and he is going to be talking on DLK and CTK. What do we know till date? Preferred practice guidelines. One, two, three like that sure. you give your points. Sure. So uh, I think uh, 
we've all, uh, all those of us who do refractive surgery, we probably all dealt with uh, at least the DLK and some of us with the CTK. So DLK is basically a non-infectious inflammation localized to the flap interface uh, following refractive surgery and it's also commonly known as the Sands of Sahara syndrome. The initial reported incidence used to be 2 to 4 percent. We might be seeing it much, much less now because we've understood all the reasons why uh, DLK used to happen but we still occasionally would get to see a grade 1 a DLK and unfortunately sometimes even a more severe one. So the etiology of DLK when we started doing refractive surgery used to be thought to be RBCs in the interface, fibers, uh, uh, bimobian uh, secretions, uh, glove talc and that's why we went on. Uh, most LASIK surgeons used to operate without gloves in the beginning and now that we have excellent quality uh, talcless gloves. So uh, microkeratom oil was uh, implicated uh, right when we started off in the 90s and even marker pens. Uh, so the risk factors also for uh, predisposition for DLK could be corneal abrasions, uh, microkeratom induced epithelial defects, recurrent er erosion syndromes and iritis, viral keratoconjunctivitis or a past history of one, allergies and contact lens wearers. So these people have to be more careful when uh, looking for possibility of getting a DLK. Also maybe even enhancements uh, when they are done on the flap, uh, they can also be another cause for getting DLK even in a smile interface. So the pathogenesis has been thought to be recruitment of the PMN leukocytes to the stromal interface and it usually develops one to two days following refractive surgery and typically resolves within five to eight days uh, with treatment. The initial symptoms may be pain and photophobia, redness and blurring of vision and uh, foreign body sensation and a stage one DLK would start in the periphery going on to a stage two DLK where there may be central involvement and then a stage three DLK where is more aggregation of dense white and clump cells in the visual axis and then going on to scarring and even a hyperopic shift with irregular astigmatism. This may necessitate in the stage four a uh, flap lift and interventions as well and usually it's best to intervene early as well so that uh, if you are having a, a DLK which is progressive and more severe. CTK in, uh, in contrast is a non-inflammatory opacification of the stromal bed and uh, can be seen after LASIK, PRK or uh, even CXL and even SMILE and uh, CTK or central toxic keratopathy is rarely associated with AC reactions, conjunctival hyperemia or ciliary flush and some of the misnomers and uh, it's been thought to be confused with stage 4 DLK as well. But this typically develops a little later uh, than typical DLK and by the third or fourth day. The incidence is very, very less as compared to what we might know for DLK, so a 0.016 percent. I've had only one case in 20 years uh, but it was enough to kind of, uh, you know, teach you everything about it. So the pathogenesis seems to be almost similar. Uh, interface debris, uh, all the same things have been thought. Nobody really knows why CTK may happen but uh, it, it's a toxic reaction to some substance and photoactivation by the laser. So here is how they kind of compare to each other. DLK will usually be diffuse and CTK is more dense and focal. It's like a coin shape please and right, right in the middle of the cornea and uh, no stri in DLK but uh, CTK almost always comes with stri. Uh, DLK will have no refractive change mostly but uh, later on it can develop whereas in CTK you will uh, usually uh, see a hyperopic shift which will happen and it takes a long time to go away and CTK does not respond to steroids whereas DLK will respond to steroids and DLK resolves much faster on treatment whereas CTK does not really respond it just takes its own time and you can't do much about it. So these are the symptoms, similar symptoms, photophobia, floaters, pain, halos, hyperopic shift, fall in vision is usually the first thing that the patient presents with. And this is how it looks on the diagnosis on sit lamp examination and the OCT. Uh, a pentacam will be quite fallacious and typically what you see is under the flap you'll see the stromal, anterior stromal involvement going sometimes even much deeper and uh, frankly pentacam may show, I'll try to show a few slides which when I had my CTK case. So differential diagnosis is with uh, DLK, PISC and uh, infectious keratitis and post PRK haze. And uh, DLK treatment I think most of us understand, stage 1 topical steroids, stage 2 we might add topical and oral steroids, uh, stage 3 we would have to go into a flap lift and irrigate and along with steroids and then stage 4 requires much more aggressive intervention. And these are how the three things uh, differ in management, DLK, PISC and CTK. CTK as you see at the bottom is only observation, you should not uh, elevate the flap uh, really. Whereas uh, DLK will respond to steroids and PISC you will discontinue the steroids and start anti-glaucoma medication. So treatment for CTK as I said, you know initially you can do a trial of steroids, most of us will do that but eventually you realize that it's not helping and uh, you'll, you'll kind of, I'll just ma'am uh, show one slide to, to explain it better. I have a small slide of uh, a PISC uh, of a CTK. So. It's good, it's there. I'll just show it in 30 seconds. So this is one patient whom I operated uh, during AIOS as it always happens whenever I'm in the AIOS meeting it always ends up having something going on while I'm away. 
my CTK, my DLKs have happened when I've traveled. So 26 years old male PG uh, student underwent un un uh, the same, uneventful uh, femtolasic on the IFS 150 and uh, was doing extremely well on day one and suddenly when I'm here three days later, four days later, he calls up saying that there's a sudden fall, uh, reports to our clinic, vision is down to 624, the pressures are normal and this is how it looks. So this is what I wanted to show you, how it looked. And uh, frankly, this patient after six, seven years has visited me only like two weeks back. He's now six, six, unaided. He was so unhappy. He was on uh, dietary supplements. He was on, uh, you know, and this is what I wanted to show on OCT, how it might look. And on Pentacam, you'll actually sometimes confuse it with ectasia. So be very careful. Pentacam is very fallacious. Uh, you know, it can give you wrong information because the shine plug imaging cannot go deep enough to look at this. And frankly, this is all I wanted. So this is what the OCTs will look like. This is the stromal inflammation. We managed it initially with steroid and then later on pulled off the steroids. Took three months for him to come to about 6.9 with a small plus 0.75 correction. Very dissatisfied to begin with. But over a year, he settled down to almost 6.6 vision and we didn't have to really do much. Thank you very much, Gaurav. Lot of explanation. Just one, two question. We conclude because I have to start my next one. Uh, in DLK in smile and in uh, femtoflap, do you notice any difference in the presentation? Dr. Sri Ganesh, uh, Somshila or Dhami, any thought you have? Uh, with femto, it's more in the periphery. Uh, mm -hmm. We see this, and they can have more light sensitivity. It's uh, more common in the high energy uh, lasers, mm -hmm. uh, like the earlier uh, interlace, which was uh, 50 hertz. But now, with the higher speed lasers, uh, high frequency lasers, it is less common. With the microkeratom, it's usually diffuse. And, uh, in smile? Like sa uh, sans uh, smile, extremely rare. We have hardly had, because it's a very low energy, mm. but you can have any Since lamellar surgery, any lamellar surgery, you can have uh, DL candidates, usually because of endotoxin. Uh, so you have to look at your sterilization. We had a crop of uh, DLKs when we were using the statin sterilizer because the reservoir yeah. was not changed. So we used to get that. It's probably because of the endotoxic. So I prefer to immediately wash. If I see any DLK, it's not that I give trial of steroids because sometimes in yeah. 24 hours, you can have clumping and you can have... Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yes. uh, stromal melt. So immediately I wash and then put steroids in. And also Anything to add, uh, uh, Somshila? No, just that uh, we've not seen DLK, at least we maybe we missed it, but after smile, but we have seen CTK. It's very rare. Oh. Uh, maybe you've seen it too. I want yes. to just say that in smile, typically, you know, you have to be more More focal in smile, actually. Yeah, oh, more focal you should might suspect infection, rarely. In, in this regard, job. I wanted to ask that uh, there's been debate about washing the interface in smile. Some people don't do it at all and others like to, uh, you know, wash. So what's the consensus? I uh, wouldn't wash. I would just stroke it. And okay, yeah. just one comment. Huh. Uh, uh, I don't have experience like smile, what you all have. I've done a few cases. It's all clear on the ZA. One patient in one eye developed white diffuse spots in the area of the lenticule. And I was completely confused because I'd never seen anything like this in LASIK. I called up Rohit and I sent him the video and immediate confocal, they have seen this in smile, they did confocal and it was localized skeletocyte activity which has increased and it disappears over six months. I think so you I'm have just to look at your an energies. Example. You have to look at the energy. Have you all ever any time done a repeat interface wash? Has it been needed in your experience? It has not been, but I think if at all there is, you could still do it. As long as you don't confuse it with central toxic keratopathy because that will take its own longer time to resolve. Uh, I am sure I would have had a lot more uh, discussions if all my speakers had been sitting there right from the beginning because I wasted too much time on calls. But I'm so happy you all were here with us and I'm sure there would be something you learned and a lot I learned too. Thank you for being with us. We'll come back with an even better structured program next year. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, dear speakers. Can a photograph be taken with expert panel?